That was a wonderful opening, and um, we appreciate the mayor being here and sort of setting the stage for us today as we go into these discussions. I think he framed framed our desire very well to have an open dialogue um, and produce some good ideas about how to how to sustain our lands and um, have a thriving energy industry in Texas. So I'm going to introduce our first panel. Um, the topic of which is energy and conservation, can they coexist? And I think we, we believe the answer is yes, I'll just preview that. I'm going to in, introduce our speakers, each of whom will speak for 12, 15 minutes, and then we'll have time for a question and answer and some discussion among the panelists after that. Okay, so first speaker is Joe Kiesecker, Dr. Joe Kiesecker. He's a lead scientist for the Nature Conservancy Conservation Lands Team. Um, he pioneered the Nature Conservancy's development by design process, which he will tell you about, and which was really the foundation of the Respect Big Bend project that the Mitchell Foundation um, funded in uh, the Tri-County area of West Texas. <clears throat> He is an expert on ecology, on conservation biology, animal behavior. He's taught at um, numerous universities, academic um, institutions, including Yale, Penn State, University of Wyoming, <coughs> and has published extensively. Dr. Lewis Harvison, who many of you know, I'm sure, is the founder and the director of the Borderlands Research Institute, which was the lead on the Respect Big Bend, Big Bend Project. <clears throat> he holds the Dan Allen Hughes Jr. Endowed Directorship at Sol Ross State University. He's very active, uh, an active leader in numerous organizations around the state on wildlife conservation, like the Texas Wildlife Association, and also active in national organizations like the Wildlife Society. Dr. Michael Young, who's a senior research scientist for the Bureau of Economic Geology at the University of Texas. He focuses on environmental geosciences, hydrology, soil science. He was the lead um, energy scientist in our Respect Big Bend project. He has published extensively on soil science issues, water resources, and is a fellow of the Geological Society of America. And then finally, last but certainly not least, we're delighted that Richard Brantley, who's the Senior Vice President for Operations of University Lands, um, is here with us today. University Lands um, owns the minerals and surface rights for over two million acres of land in West Texas, from which a lot of oil and gas is produced, as well as solar power. Um, Mr. Brantley serves on the Midland Chamber of Commerce. He um, is part of the Texas Water and Energy Institute, and he holds two patents. So he's, um, we're delighted to have Mr. Brantley with us as well. Okay, so with that, we'll get started. A workshop or conference. Um, so I've been tasked to talk a little bit about what's at stake. Uh, when we talk about energy development and trying to find a balance, uh, just really what does that take and, and how do you change kind of a corporate mindset. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about really the, the natural history of the region, both the Permian Basin as well as the Trans-Pecos, uh, some of the challenges uh, that we face every day and that are, that are burgeoning, um, at, you know, just right around the corner, and then talk a little bit about land and some of the planning we did, again, through Respect Big Bend, through the development by design. And so when, when I talk about this region, uh, you know, I, I refer to West Texas as the Trans-Pecos, the Big Bend, the Permian Basin, uh, but most affectionately, we call it uh, our last frontier. It's Texas' last frontier. It's one of the most unique places in the world. And between the Permian Basin and the Trans-Pecos, uh, there's a lot of similarities. We, we, we share the same sunsets. We share, uh, we share the same dirt. I'm pretty sure some of that dirt that blew in last night was from my front yard. Um, and we certainly, uh, and then there's also some disparities, right? We know that Trans-Pecos is a little bit more pristine and the Permian Basin is a little bit more um, uh, industrialized, I guess. Um, but historically, we all started the same. Uh, we know that man has been here over 10,000 years. We've had a variety of cultures uh, come through the region uh, in, in both areas, uh, culminating into uh, really the first written record was Cabeza de Vaca in 1528. If you ever thought you were having a bad day, you really need to read his account on how difficult life was in 1528 because uh, he, he lived an incredible life, an incredible journey. 
but he did chronicle some of the early uh, records of the region uh, with respect to natural history. And it really wasn't until a little over 100 years ago that we really had good documentation. We had photographs. We knew what the landscape looked like before we really started getting after it. Uh, early uh, explorers like uh, Bailey and Miriam and Fuertes, they did a great job of recording things and part of a government contract uh, to document the natural history of the region. Obviously in Trans-Pecos, uh, a big step for us was uh, the culmination of the park and uh, organizing that park and founding it in 1944. Uh, but again, in, in Midland, you know, Midland was the midpoint. That's how Midland came to be. It was a midpoint between Fort Worth and El Paso. And then things started happening then. We, they discovered oil and so forth. But again, throughout this whole process, it's been private lands that has been the common theme for that landscape. And so today, the Trans-Pecos is, is something very different than what it was, uh, not, not as much as the Permian Basin. Uh, but it's still our last frontier. It's still the playground for Texas. You can't uh, pick up a Texas monthly magazine without some sort of uh, feature story on the Big Bend region. Uh, and then really, the, the communities themselves are all very different. Uh, and again, it's an agriculturally dominated landscape. Uh, for the Permian Basin, again, 100 years of energy development. This is the, the, the center of the earth with respect to energy, uh, both in uh, oil and gas as well as renewables. And, and the feel of the Midland, especially downtown last night, I've been downtown in, in two or three years, uh, it, it's, it's got a great vibe. It's got a great small town feel in a, in a very industrial, uh, forward-thinking town. But from a diversity standpoint, there's a lot going on. Uh, Trans-Pecos in particular, if you drove from here all the way up to Davis Mountains, you'd go through all these life zones. And with that elevation gradient, there's a tremendous amount of diversity from a wildlife standpoint. A uh, variety of birds, herps, mammals, all, all documented. Our, one of our best laboratories is Big Bend National Park. And this recognition doesn't come just at a state level. These are international levels that, that has put the, the hot spots of diversity on the map for this region. And for the Permian Basin, the Permian Basin really is at a crossroads. It's crossroads of the, the State Plains, Rolling Plains, High Plains, the Trans-Pecos, and the Edwards Plateau. And so there's a tremendous amount of habitat diversity throughout this region. And you don't have to go far to, to pick up a ver variety of game species like white-tailed deer, mule deer, pronghorn, variety of quail, uh, etc. And then some of our unique habitats in the region, the sand dunes have a lot of endemic species tied to them. Uh, the prairie dog colonies have a tremendous amount of diversity and of course our playa lakes in particular. But really the, our biggest challenge I think as, as, as a country, as a state, as a, as a region is people. Uh, people is really what's driving things. People is what's driving the energy demand, but people is also what's, what's going to put the pressure on the land, and it's really all about the land. Uh, we're expecting over 50 million people in Texas by 2050. That is a tremendous amount of people. That's almost doubling to, from where we are today. Uh, the Trans-Pecos, looking at an eight or nine county, you know, we're under a million. You take out El Paso County, we're only about 100,000 people over about seven counties. Uh, for Midland and Ector County specifically, again, we're, we're looking at about 250,000 people. And again, that, that is growing. And so we're going to see a lot of changes and a lot of pressures put on the landscape. And we look at the landscape, uh, our good friends at the Natural Resource Institute are really the, really the, the state uh, demographers uh, for lands. And we're, we're growing literally at over 1,000, I think it's actually close to 1,500 individuals a day in the state. Uh, and, and that's, and you can see where they're going. They're going to the urban centers along I-35, along the Texas coast, a little bit of El Paso. But you also see uh, Middle and Odessa cropping up in there, and Amarillo, and Canyon, and Abilene, and things like that. So they're, come, they're becoming urban urbanites. And as that, that grows, they're starting to envelop and take into more and more rural lands. Uh, again, the state is 95% privately owned, and again, that, that has a lot to do with uh, how the republic uh, was developed uh, for this state. Uh, but again, most of those lands are tied up in agriculture, in some sort of farm, ranch, or forest, and those are the natural resources that we cherish, that we need, that we need to make sure are still here for our future. And again, in a 15-year period, we lost over a million acres classified 
previously as agriculture to another product. And as a good friend of ours says, uh, you know, asphalt is the last land use for any land in, in the state. And of course, with, with growing populations, there's certainly a need for energy. Uh, Joe did a great job, despite the technical difficulties, uh, of really setting the, the landscape on the needs for energy on a global scale and how the global economy of these energy demands affect us even in our backyard. And so we need to plan, we need to do better. Uh, the, our, our session title is called Can Energy and Conservation Coexist? Uh, spoiler alert, yes it can. Uh, we just have to do better and that's one of my mantras I, I carry every day is we can do better and, and that's, that's really what we're trying to get through today. And with respect to energy, we know things happen quickly. In a seven year time span, just look at the difference in the landscape and the, the viewed as light illumination uh, for the Permian and Delaware basins, things happen really, really rapidly. One of the fun fundamental um, caveats of development by design is get in early and make sure you plan. And that's really not the mindset that we have a lot of times in our energy development. That's something we need to really reevaluate. And so really the question comes down to how do we achieve balance? How do we make sure that we have conservation uh, coupled with energy demand and how can we do this in a more thoughtful manner. And conservation is, is, you know, it's a relatively new word. We use it in our conservation organizations all the time, but we take it for granted of what it really means to different people. Uh, and obviously it means different things. Uh, to some it may be as simple as recycling in your, in your household or, or doing a compost garden. Uh, or again, what we saw a little bit last night is the, the dust and, and putting in uh, cover crops and things like that. Or it could be just how you manage uh, the natural resources with restoration or hunting or, or grazing. But it, it is something that is in every household today, the word conservation, and we need to better define it and better guide people on how that may happen, especially with respect to energy. But all of it comes back to the land. The land is the common denominator of everything we do. Uh, it is the habitat that uh, we, we need for our wildlife. It, is the, it catches water and channels our, our water for our waterways. Uh, it is for the, the fruits and vegetables that we cultivate. It's for the meat that we graze. Uh, it's, it's where we build our houses and everything else. But it's also where we extract resources. And it's, it's a common denominator. So when we talk about conservation, it's really about the land itself. And this could be me in about 20, 30 years maybe as a profile picture, but that's, that's a guy named Aldo Leopold, and he was uh, the father of wildlife management, and he, he was really the one that coined the term land ethic. And it states here that land ethic is really a call for moral responsibility to the natural world, a way to connect people, the land, and people to the land so that we respect all of it together. And land ethics are really, if, if we were to, if I was in a lecture hall and y'all were in my classroom, We'd sit there and we'd have a long conversation about what is the character of the Permian Basin? What are the values of the Permian Basin? And it, it, it differs by individual and it d differs by region. But ethics are really based on values. And we had the uh, fortune of having the Mitchell Foundation help support us uh, with a, a great little experiment trying to figure out what the values are for the Big Bend region. Again, we refer that as the Respect Big Bend Project and the development, development by design and the key steps here. But the main thing is the conservation vision, right? Is, is you need to know what you, what you cherish, what you value, and then what you can do about it. And so I'm gonna briefly talk about that in our stakeholder uh, process that we had. Uh, over a three year period, we pulled together a variety of stakeholders, basically community members, energy industry, representative landowners, uh, and all the like, and we sat them down, and over a two-year period and hundreds of hours of talking about what matters most to them for this region, uh, we, we came up with a, a values, uh, both conservation values and social values. And again, two years of, of work and effort is coming down to one slide. And if you've ever been to the Big Bend region, and you, as you read these, you're, I'm hoping you're nodding your head, because I've been living in the Big Bend region for about 24 years, and these resonate very much to me on what's important, what draws people to that. Now, if we went through the same exercise in the Permian Basin, 
we're going to see some similarities, but we're probably going to see some differences. Our values differ a little bit, uh, but some of these things, uh, safety and community and quality of life, uh, view sheds, sunsets, all these kind of things, these are all important to everyone. But again, everybody has different values, and so it would be a great experiment to do, but we had the fortune, again, of having the financial backing of the, the Mitchell Foundation and others uh, to help us get there. And so our next step was taking these values, listening to those stakeholders, and then putting them in some sort of spatial format so that we can understand what that looks like on the landscape. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Alex is coming up here this afternoon to talk about what that looks like. But what I'm going to show you is kind of the end product. Again, if we put the values, we weighted them all equally, and we kind of slapped all those together to see uh, where those areas are most pristine, most valuable, according to that tri-county stakeholder group, this is what it would look like. And if you look at uh, you know, the scale from green was a, a value, very high value, and purple, low value, uh, again, through the eyes of the Permian Basin, um, you know, you're going to come up with a different value system in, in a different map. But for us and our, our group, this was important. And it, and it really does identify some of the more pristine habitats and regions of far west Texas. And again, we extrapolated those into the Permian Basin and some of the other areas. So I'm going to leave that here and just leave it with this slide, just that, you know, West Texas is our home. It's a, it's a place that we love. We choose to be here. Um, it is what people think of when they think of Texas. It is iconic Texas, and it's something that we have the opportunity to take care of, and we're, we're here to help. And we have a lot of experts on these panels and, and future panels uh, that are here to help you along that way. So I'm going to pass the mic to, to Michael. Actually. That's awesome, Lewis, and thank you for setting me up. <laughs> it's fabulous. Um, and uh, it's great to see everybody here, and uh, I'm just going to go straight in. Um, our role within the Respect Big Bend project was to basically look at the energy projection side of, of what we anticipate over the next 30 years. This is the... Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Kip. Um, over the next 30 years for both oil and gas as well as renewables. And, and these numbers, they, they're changing a lot. I mean, uh, Mayor Payton was talking about, could anybody have imagined two years ago? All that has happened in the last two years. It's just completely insane. And so what we, so some of these numbers are, are probably a little bit dated, but, but perhaps not. And Joe mentioned early on, without any props, unfortunately, about energy density. So this graph shows energy density on the, on the x-axis is what's known as power density, and it's the number of watts per meter square that, um, that of energy that can be generated um, depending on the energy type. And, and the gray boxes are, are showing basically fossil energy from uh, nuclear, natural gas, um, and, uh, and, and oil. And you can see, and, and coal, and you can see you know, the, the x-axis is on a log scale. So it's almost 100 times more energy can be created with fossil energy than can be created with renewables. And so the green boxes on the bottom are solar, geothermal, and wind. And what that means is that if we want to maintain energy generation, we need more land in order to do it if we are going to, quote, transition or expand energy sources into renewables. And this is physics, so it's not a po political statement. This is just the way it has to be if we're going to essentially do this. And as, uh, as we're growing in the state by, what, 1,500 people a day into the state of Texas, um, there's going to be a demand for, uh, for energy and electricity in order for people to, to basically live their lives. And, um, and so our job was to try to look into the crystal ball with as much clarity as possible with some clear eyes and say, what do we anticipate going forward over the next 30 years? And how does that map onto the land values that Lewis just showed? And so I'm going to show you this again. These are the land asset classes that Lewis just provided. Um, green, these are, again, these are coming from um, the Tri-County um, Stakeholder Advisory Group and the things that they value, open spaces and dark skies, uh, intact grasslands, riparian areas, and all of the other 10 or 12 different factors that, um, and, and ranching uh, heritage was particularly important, of, of what people found valuable for the land that they, that they cherish that's been in their family for generations. Our question was, where is energy generation going to be relative to these colors? And are there opportunities to continue to develop 
um, energy and electricity in particular, if it's renewables, without impacting the really high quality land that's of value to landowners. And by doing work like this, we can put information into the hands of landowners and energy uh, and the energy industry so that together they can have a conversation. This is what the mayor was talking about this morning, the importance of conversation. This information provides that opportunity. So getting right to the punchline, we, we looked at a variety of different um, um, ways of estimating what we think oil and gas um, generation might be in the future. Um, we came up with with different ranges, a high range and a low range, and what we call the BAU case, the business as usual case. And in our um, estimate, the BAU case was three wells per drilling pad, each drilling pad being about five acres in size. And after talking with multiple energy companies, this was about the sweet spot. You know, we, we looked at one well per pad, which is the high land use case. We looked at nine wells per pad, which is the, the high conservation case, with much, much less land impacts. And so um, depending on how you look through this, this is the high impact case with either more drilling or fewer wells per pad. And the color scheme that you're looking at is the percent of area that's been impacted by energy development. And the darker colors are nearly 100% of the, of the area. So if you were to look at acreage or, or square kilometers or square miles, that's basically what these numbers are showing. So there's a very high concentration, it's no secret, in the northern Delaware Basin, north of Midland, in the Midland Basin, and all throughout the region. You know, operators are finding good rock. We know where the good rock is located, and they are going after those rock to find energy. And that's... Uh, that's what we all need. That's what landowners are, are, are benefiting from. The question then is, is there uh, a way to develop these, um, these assets without necessarily impacting the land? And you can see on this, on, you know, in the, little, you know, in the southern tri-counties, there's very little likelihood of, of really intensive oil and gas development in, the, in you know, Brewster, Presidio, and Jeff Davis counties because the geologic border of the Delaware Basin rides along the county line, and it's, there doesn't appear to be that much. So, um, so we found this early on, and we were like, wow, that's amazing. Um, it took a little bit of wind out of our sails in terms of the, the study. We're like, well, look, let's pivot toward renewables, because we know that renewables are going to become sort of a thing going forward. What does this look like going forward? So our group started looking at what's the electricity generation going to look like over the next um, uh, 20 to 30 years. We ran some capacity assessment models that ERCOT uses when they, they kind of conjure up, well, we think we're going to have X number of gigawatts of electricity capacity that's going to need to be connected up to the cities and to the load centers. Um, they come up with graphs like this. This is a, a near-term near projection for solar development. This is updated every month. You can go to ERCOT and download the graph yourself. It's fascinating to see. And what you're looking at is over the next year or two that there's an expectation of somewhere on the order of, oh, I don't know, uh, 10 to 12 to 15 gigawatts of additional storage capacity or additional generation capacity for solar across the state. A lot of this is going to be in West Texas, but it's going to be, but it's going to be kind of distributed over certain areas. And if we're looking at wind, this is what we expect for wind development, an additional 5 to 7 to maybe 10 gigawatts of additional wind development in the general West Texas area. Now the question is, where might that be and what are the land characteristics that are favorable for uh, wind and solar? And, and it's no surprise if you want to generate solar electricity, you have to have sun. And the further west you go in Texas, the sunnier it gets. So the graph on the left shows the darker red colors is what's known as global horizontal irradiance, or sort of sunlight intensity. And the further west you go, the sunnier it gets. And, um, and, and you're also getting to the western edge of the ERCOT, ERCOT area. So you know, right at the, at, at the Culberson County line, Culberson and Hudspeth is the end of ERCOT, which means that any electricity that's going to be generated in Culberson it's going to be transmitted to the east along CRES and along power lines. And, um, and, and right now, there's power line capacity for really, really large expansions of wind and solar are probably not available to move all of the electrons uh, to the load centers in Dallas, uh, Fort Worth, um, Austin, San Antonio, and, and Houston. The graph on the right is, the, is similar, only it's for wind. It's known as wind energy intensity. 
And like, how intense is it? Well, it was pretty darn intense yesterday, uh, enough to basically blind us uh, with, with soil. That was soil, not dirt. Um, for, for Lewis, I'm being a soil scientist, it's very important. Um, you know, dirt's a four letter word in soil science. And, <laughs> That's why I teach my students. And so, um, and the, and the little green uh, symbols you see are existing wind turbines. So there's still a capacity and availability of land for wind, but the wind has to be, um, it has to be very, very carefully placed so that it's, it's not on, on land that is sloping that's too steep. It's not in, it's not in areas that are in ex other kinds of exclusions because of air traffic control and, and things like that. So there's a, a narrow window where wind energy generators are able to place their turbines and their facilities. And so we were then asking the question, and I think that Joe mentioned, there is probably 100 times more land available in West Texas than is going to be needed for all the electricity generation from renewables that's expected over the next 20 to 30 years. 100 times more available. So I'll let that kind of sit with you for a second. Two orders of magnitude more. Um, and so um, we're starting off with that as, as a reason for conversation. This graph shows where areas are favorable based on mostly on sunlight. And, and, and people who are planning um, solar, solar installations are looking at a variety of different factors. It's not just sunlight. If you want to put in a 100 megawatt or a 500 megawatt facility, you need power lines in order to move your electrons. If you don't have power lines, then you just invested somebody's money and you're not going to get any return on investment because you can't move the energy anywhere. So when we talk to um, solar energy operators, we ask them, what is important to you? And some of them said, well, well, we'll lay our own power lines. Others said, if it's far away from a power line, we can't afford to put our facility out there. So, so um, uh, proximity to power lines was the most important. So you can see the graph on the right shows that kind of stippled pattern. It gets darker to the west because it's sunnier to the west. If we look only at transmission, then it basically, you know, the dark colors are sitting right on top of power lines. And so we can basically work with operators and say, what is important to you as you choose where to put your facility? And if it's more on sunlight, if it's more on power lines, if it's access to roadways, if it's proximity to other facilities, they have to watch out for, for load congestion. These are things that, that operators are looking at and that we are trying to incorporate into kind of an online app, which I'll show you. So if we do all the, all the electricity generation going forward, this is approximately how much land might be needed. Somewhere between 890,000 acres uh, to 4.3 million acres in that range. Now, without me passing judgment, that's a lot, that's a little, that's about what the numbers show based on the next 30 years. And that was before COVID and before Ukraine. So what does that look like today? We, we really don't know. Um, what that's going to be, but you know, oil was at 102 this morning. Um, West Texas Intermediate hit 102 because I checked it on my app, which I do several times a day now because I'm crazy about it. Um, what does this really mean going forward? We're not really sure, and 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 thankfully, we're able to get groups like this together to have conversations. Now, uh, uh, Billy and and and, um, uh, and Lewis are going to be talking later and throughout about the center, the engagement center for, um, um, for landowners to basically, and for industry to go and look and, and work together to identify good land. We took the, the sort of the GIS app that created this and we've moved it to an online app, which is a web-based tool. And so anybody would be able to go to the center, access this site, put in the criteria that you all find is important, and then generate a map showing what's favorable and what's not favorable. And this puts the power of, of information and planning kind of into the hands of landowners so that they understand what the assets and what the potentials are, as well as for industry to get a sense of where are there areas where they can conduct their business without creating conflict. And all of these are really kind of important aspects and, and particularly for the discussion today. So um, I'm gonna stop here because I probably went over and, and give the microphone to, to Richard. I'm actually gonna be your AV operator here. Um, and, uh, and so if there's any questions, I, I hope that we have enough time to talk about them. Thank you. And I'd like to thank everyone for the opportunity to be here. It's always a wonderful time to, uh, you know, share uh, thoughts and, and, and our ideas about land and landscapes. Yep. Need to hear a little better, Scott? All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> before I get started, I'd like to give a shout out to Jeff White, uh, our uh, 
Surface Manager Operations, Jeff's back here in the back. I know many of you know him, and uh, he's really a, a very, you know, substantial part of our University Lands operation. Uh, just give you a little bit of uh, background on University Lands. Uh, you may know that these lands were set aside for the benefit of higher education uh, in the Constitution of Texas as back in 1876. The, uh, the Constitution set aside a million acres, and then the... Uh, legislature a few years later set aside another million so in total we have a little over 2.1 million acres it's in 19 west texas counties uh geographically from stretches from el paso to uh, san angelo almost and then north and south from andrews county to terrell county we've got big contiguous blocks and that's one of the great benefits as opposed to uh you know some of the other state lands that were checkerboarded like the uh, railroad surveys the GLO is, is challenged with those checkerboard surveys, but we've got big contiguous blocks, and, uh, and we're very privileged to be able to care for those resources, both the minerals and the surface, uh, as, we, uh, as we steward these lands. We've got lots of different activities out there on these, on these lands, uh, about 250 different operators, uh, oil and gas operators, uh, 3,500 or plus oil and gas leases. There's probably, you know, 15,000 surface contracts of some type or another we've got everything on these lands from from convenience stores to public schools to wineries to wind farms solar farms uh, about 10,000 oil and gas wells lots of different activities uh, Jeff and our uh, our team's you know primary uh, daily toil is to try to uh, you know monitor the playground out there and make sure that everybody is successful doing what they're trying to do and what we've contracted with them to do at any one given time there's probably 25,000 people operating are doing something on university land so it's it's a it's a lot to look after but it's a very uh, great privilege to look after we uh, we promote the use of these lands the utilization of these lands the conservation of these lands kind of 24 7 it's kind of a promote and protect 24 7 and uh, one of the things that, uh, that, you know, I want you to be sure that you understand is, you know, we've got, you know, we've got a, a mission statement, which is, you know, uh, you know several, several uh, it's a paragraph long, but our primary goals are to make money for the university systems. This is both UT and Texas A&M. And combined, there's 26, you know, either campuses or medical schools or something like that. Really, as Texans, we're all direct beneficiaries of this widespread you know distribution of education and health care across our state as well as all the ag programs natural resource programs that texas a m operates so those are the the primary goals you know make money take care of the resource and you know like many of us we uh, i think professionally we have a you know a 30-year time horizon that's the way we look at it. university lands we look at this you know in, in in we think about it in centuries we'll we'll soon have the 100th anniversary of the santa rita number one well which really sort of uh you know uh lewis talked about you know as, as things begin to progress out from fort worth that was the uh, arguably the first commercial well in uh, in the permian basin and it is coincidental to me this happened in 1923 it's coincidental to me that, that that well was on university lands and 88 years later, the first horizontal well in the Wolf Camp Shale was drilled on university lands about uh, 20 miles east of that Santa Rita well. Both of those two events changed, you know, our whole conversation about mineral and energy development on these, uh, on these lands. I've got some slides here. I guess you can't see them. I hope that this slide deck will be made available to you. Uh, I've got uh, some links here that would, would uh, lead you to the University Lands web page and specifically our surface and environmental tabs on that web page and I've, I've taken the opportunity to add some hyperlinks that will take you directly to some different things just to sort of show you how we go about things not to say that you know we're perfect we've, but we've got we're blessed with a very agile team uh, subject matter experts and I believe that we're able to look at these lands and, and manage these spaces perhaps better uh, we have we have, have the opportunity to have more resources than perhaps you know a fee landowner somewhere who uh, you know it, you know has oil companies coming to them solar companies coming to them just here's what we want to do and uh, and so I'd, I'd, I'd offer you these these guides if you would uh, as tools you know to use at your uh, at your choosing but uh, we've got you know this 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 web page is kind of broken down to air soil and water 
and uh, and so I would encourage you to look at those and, and look at these. We we publish a, a field operations manual and a soil remediation guide, groundwater management plan, seed mixtures, and and then a, a page with best practices. But uh, I'd like to kind of shift gears away from okay, that's that's what the university lands is and what we do. But I'd like for us to think about for just a minute, co sort of roll back to our topic, you know, the coexistence of of energy and conservation. And I I would suggest to you that our our society is changing. You know, you heard the mayor describe these different you know uh, partisan perspectives, but. Over the years, you know, I, I can remember back in the 1990s, early 90s, when the word environmental began to kind of really roll forward in our conversations uh, in business. And, you know, I was in a seminar one time, they, they asked by, you know, by decade and age group, you know, if you'd heard, did you hear the word environment in elementary school? Well, I certainly never did. It was probably in college when I first heard that, you know, the first time. But as you go younger and younger generations, of course, you know the, the elementary schools. I was talking to Aldine last night, and she works with little kids in, in public schools. And, and that is a primary focus of this, you know, early generation. And it'll be about two blinks before these kindergartners are 25 and, and following in the, uh, the footsteps of, of all of us. So it's, it's important that we recognize this, but it's also uh, fundamental that we recognize that the investor, you know, mindset has also made a shift change in recent years. And a lot of it is because the younger groups coming along, younger generations coming along, they are now the uh, active investors. And, and you may know this, that uh, this, this whole conversation about ES and G, you know, environment, social, and uh, it's really social consciousness and governance is, is really worked its way into our, our uh, vocabulary and our daily conversations. Uh, I looked this up on Wikipedia and, and it actually says under the environment, environmental, it says environmental criteria may include a company's energy use, waste pollution, natural resource conservation, that's what it says, and treatment of animals. Social is the social criteria that uh, a company uses in its business relationships, the way it treats people, the way it be, interacts with people. And then governance is the, uh, is the company leadership accountable and transparent with investors and the public. This is something, and you may well know these things, but many of the oil and gas operators that are out there today, certainly the public companies and many of the private, uh, you know, private equity backed in entities, you know, have, they're required to provide sustainability reports and have an ESG metric. In fact, many of the uh, CEOs and, and C-suite, uh, you know, teams of these, these groups have ESG uh, achievements tied to their compensation. So it's not just, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to look at this a little bit. It's, it's really working its way into the uh, fundamentals of investing. I, uh, I would... I wish you could see this slide because it goes from 1995 to, to, to 2020 and it, it illustrates the investment in ESG uh, critical investments. You know, I mean, those investment, you know, you may have a mutual fund, but some of its fundamentals is the ESG component. It's gone from about, uh, well, a little less than a trillion to seven, in, in 1995, a trillion invested in, in those, you know, ESG focused fundamentals to 17 trillion these days. So it's, it's really a ramp up in the uh, societal expectation, the way things uh, should be managed. Um, you know, it, it's, not, it's not just individual investors, it's sovereign wealth funds, institutional investors, uh, certainly pension funds, as well as the private investors. And then, uh, you know, there's ample studies out there. I, what I'd ask you to do maybe is, is go to your, your Google search page and type in ESG and see how many hundreds of thousands of articles come up with that, uh, that key phrase in them. I mean, it's, it's in the millions. It's, uh, it's quite, uh, quite common in our, in our vocabulary these days. But there are studies that indicate that companies that are that are more focused on those sorts of fundamentals, uh, you know, provide better top line growth, cost reduction, legal and regulatory compliance, you know, adherence. Um, they get, you know, optimization in many, many, you know, business lines. So think about that, and then we'll think about how we can utilize that, that concept and that perspective that I, I can promise you, if, if any of you 
help people with land or you own land and you have oil and gas operators, I mean, even down to the lease operator, they're going to have a concept, you know, if you, if you, if you use that term and, well, what, what are your company's, you know, uh, ESG goals? What are your, you know, stewardship goals, conservation goals? You know, uh, Jason Brooks is here in the back with us. He's with, you know, Concho Resources, now Conco Phillips, and they've got a very intentional focus on, you know, stewardship of the land and conservation. And, and I, that, that's something that, that is, is moving forward in this whole industry. Uh, I can tell you that other operators that we talk with, they, uh, you know, they, they're not so, not so up to date on some of these things, but, but it is going to change. And so I would encourage us to utilize that opportunity as we begin to have these conversations to the extreme middle, as the uh, mayor described, to encourage, you know, those sorts of, you know, dialogues and uh, with with your oil and gas personnel out there um, there's lots of lots of opportunities as you well know for and I'll show you a slide here in just a minute there's lots of opportunities for for oil and gas companies to to do conservation work out there on the ground whether it be you know plugging and abandoning an old well or you know removing caliche pads uh, picking up caliche roads removing power lines that are dead and no longer being used uh, just many, many things out there. Reseeding, you know, we, we, we all know these things. And I would just recommend that uh, as you have opportunities uh, to showcase things that are of concern to you, a digital camera and your email are your two best tools. I uh, promise you that a digital image in an email will get somebody's attention. It's hard to know from a, for a CEO in Houston, what it really looks like on the ground. It might as well be on the moon. They don't know. It's, you know, it, the pumper called in and said, everything looks good out here. The pumper's used to seeing it. Um, you know, th those two things, and, and I've actually had people tell me, uh, well, would you not put those pictures in this email <laughs> you're sending me? Because it gets it in the, uh, you know, in the, uh, I mean, it's hard to ignore, quite frankly. So anyway, just to, uh, offer that as, as a tool for thought. Um, I would suggest to you that, that energy and uh, conservation, they do coexist. It's very possible. It's, it's going to take all of us. It takes a lot of work. But the momentum, I, I, I'd suggest, is, is moving in our direction from a conservation standpoint. Um, promote the natural resources, as everyone here uh, readily does each and every day. Um, encourage encourage those that you know and, and I just I just suggest to you that you know Jeff and I get to see a lot of behaviors out there that's one of the one of the best opportunities we have we we have an opportunity to observe good behavior less than good behavior applaud good behavior showcase good don't just send bad pictures send good pictures encourage you know I mean you can get a lot more done with a little bit of sweet than you can with uh, you know all the all the, uh, the hard, hard language that any of us could come up with. So think about that as you promote these ideas. I can promise you they do coexist. Uh, University Lands is a good example of that coexistence. We've got, you know, and I didn't say this, we've got a 110 grazing leases that are, you know, co-occupied with all these other things that are out there on these lands. And, uh, and you know, we're probably running, you know, 25, 30,000 animal units presently out there on these lands. And I'll just leave it with uh, asking you to pray for rain. We all need it. Thank you.